So, um, back to the parasite. Um, parasite, all the Parasite. So, <clears throat> one would think that the difference between a guest and a parasite, which is one of the necessary differences and distinctions for hospitality in the classic sense, <clears throat> one would think that the difference would be fairly straightforward. But Derrida notes that to make the distinction, you need a law. This is on page 59 through 61. You need a law. Hospitality, reception, the welcome offered have to be submitted to a basic and limiting jurisdiction, he writes. Without the right to hospitality or the right to asylum, a new arrival can only be introduced into my home in the host's at home as a parasite, a guest who is wrong, illegitimate, clandestine, liable to expulsion or arrest. So when Dobbs, for example, Lou Dobbs calls for higher levels of legal immigration and a crackdown on illegal immigration, he confirms the need to legislate the distinction, to establish laws that establish, a, to institute laws that establish a firm division between the welcome guest, who presumably confirms the host's sovereignty, and the parasitical parasite. The difficulty that Derrida is pointing out, however, is that that dichotomy can't hold. In, the guest is also wrapped up in, um, or implicated in, this um, um, parasitical structure. And that's what Derrida tries to unpack. That the guest is already implicated in this structure. So, it's the sovereign right and power of the host, as father, master, etc., head of household, to invite a guest, to welcome a guest into his home. However, this is what Derrida traces, as soon as the guest is invited in, the host becomes the guest's hostage. The power of the host is converted into the, the vulnerability of a hostage. But that's not all. Derrida continues that in as much as the invited guest, it's the invited guest who first liberates the power of his or her host. In as much as the power of the host, that is, requires a guest in order to take place at all because there's no sovereign host without an invited guest, right? This conversion from host to hostage happens right away from the start, even before the invitation has been extended. So here's Derrida, this is page 123 through 125. So it is indeed the master, Derrida writes, the one who invites the inviting host who becomes the hostage and who really always has been. And the guest, the invited hostage, becomes the one who invites the one who invites, the master of the host. The guest becomes the host's host. The guest becomes the host of the host. These substitutions turn everyone into everyone else's hostage. Such are the laws of hospitality." Close quote. So whether we're talking about a parasite or a welcome guest, Derrida tells us, hospitality in the classic sense involves hostility. And he does this, this is on page 45. Hospitality, hostility, hospitality. Um, have any of you read Levinas? He's drawing a lot of this from, from Levinas, um, the idea that the host is a hostage. Um, you are the you are the um, you are alterity's host, and you are alterity's hostage. By being the host, you are the hostage. So the early the early vocabulary, the early terminology in Levinas is is, um, is host, and then by the later works, it's hostage and it shifts, right? Um, and you could just put the little hyphen hostage, right? Because it's one and the same. A 
look at pressing further, this analysis also indicates once again, however, that, the so that sovereignty both is and is not a requirement for hospitality. Both is and is not. Sovereignty is the condition for hospitality in the classic sense. No hospitality without a home to offer. Right. But on the other hand, infinite hospitality would be what frustrates or circumvents all sovereignty. You, that's a welcome before you get the chance to say no. So in her running commentary on this lecture, Anne de Fomontel cites Derrida to signal the aporia. This is on page 56. To offer hospitality, he wonders, is it necessary to start from the certain existence of a dwelling? Or is it rather only starting from the dislocation of the shelterless, the homeless, that the authenticity of hospitality can open up? Perhaps only the one who endures the experience of being deprived of a home can offer hospitality. Okay. So in other words, perhaps hospitality is offered prior to consent or conscious choice only by the one who's not so much free to offer it up as she is originarily displaced, originally open, receptive, called to respond, without question and without sovereignty. This sort of hospitable disposition, I suggest, will come down not to ability or aptitude or will, but to a fundamental structure of exposure, which is what we've been trying to talk about, a pre-originary homelessness and vulnerability. It would come down to an inability simply to be in oneself or for oneself an inability to be self-sufficient or self-determined. Does that make sense? So there's again the tension. What would it mean? Where would hospitality have to start? From a home to offer? Or from a homeless shelterless space. There's, there's, the, there's the, um, the antinomy that you would have to straddle. Both. Both. Okay, so just as a way of sort of wrapping up this overview before we get in, I want to note that Derrida makes it very clear, and he ends the book this way, which is interesting, makes it very clear that it's not um, possible, it's not ethical, it's not advisable to choose the law over the laws. It does not come down to that. And what he does is offer you two horrible little biblical stories to drive the point home. So the first one is Lot, the story of Lot. What happens in the story of Lot? So the angels come to town and he has to offer unconditional hospitality of his daughters. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, what happens in that little story? The angels come, he invites them to... How does the story go? Do you know your Bible? Doesn't don't the guests rate the daughters? Or he has to hand over the daughters to the guests? The, 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 the townsfolk want to raise the angels. Yes. Yeah. Tell them to bring them out so we can penetrate oh. them. Yeah. And he offers them to die. He's like, well, don't take them, they're my guests. Have my daughters, they're virgins. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty. Yeah. So, I'll give you some of the, some of the um, um, biblical. Quotes. Um, 
in the New International Version, it says, uh, well, first of all, the two angels, they come, you know this much, this story, the two angels come, and Lot insists that they stay with him. Let me be your host. Right. So they're in his home, and that night, um, as the New International Version puts it, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. <laughs> This is, a, this is a nasty little story, it like, and it only gets worse as you keep going. Surrounded the house. The men um, demanded that Lot send his guests outside so that they might, this is the new international, international version, have sex with them. King James Version says, um, so that we may know them. Um, okay, so what, here, what happens next is this. Um, so... Um, in this demonstration of us inhospitable hospitality, in order to this is Derrida, in order to protect the guest he is putting up at any price, as family head and all powerful father, Lot, who's who is himself a foreigner in Sodom, a guest there, quote offers the men of Sodom his two daughters, his two virgin daughters. They have not yet been penetrated by men. That's on page 151. So again, back to the New International Version. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to, be, out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Close quote. Yay, right? Um, so Lot demonstrates infinite hospitality without consideration for the moral, politico ethical, as Derrida puts it, obligations that lock him into his, that, lock, that link him to his relatives and his family and first of all his daughters. So um, when the law is not conditioned by the rights and duties of the laws, right? Um, what you get is the inverse of hospitality. Um, well, yeah. Or is it the non-possibility? I mean, this is mm -hmm. it's sovereignty to, to a certain extent. Um, Sorry, I get you. It, it, um, the non, the, the, the impossibility of, of hospitality, because he's giving away his sovereignty to a certain extent, right? I mean, sending his daughters, send, I mean. Well, he's holding on to his sovereignty in or, he, and and protecting his he's protecting at all costs his guests. This is this is um, a faithfulness to the law at all costs. Without this is no attempt to straddle here. Right. At all. Right. But his his identity um, as a father and as a patriarch. The very thing that allows him to have this stable abode. Right. Um, right. He is essentially um, giving away to preserve this law mm. of hospitality. Wouldn't the infinite law extend also to his daughters? Aren't they guests? Or they can't be mm -hmm. property probably? They're, yeah, they're his property he yeah. can do with. You see, this is part of the problem. Yeah. That um, if if the laws, the rights, the duties, etc., that we um, if the political structures that we set up are not taken into account, then the ones who pay, all kinds of horrible substitutions can happen. Right. And the ones who pay are the ones who can't basically either defend themselves or be guests. Mm -hmm. Does he know? Sorry, it's just, it's like, does Lot know that um, that his guests are they're angels? They're, yeah, 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 and he knows that, so he's obeying. But I think it would the law would have been the same regardless. It would have been the same. Uh -huh, but yeah. also, isn't this in Sodom, which is eventually wiped mm -hmm. off the map of, for many yes. of these yeah. reasons? I mean, yeah. So it's almost as if it's in an upended circumstance to begin with. Well, well, they wipe it out for inhospitality, at least in the Jewish tradition, that's what it was. It's not, 
you hear that Sodom and is ethnic Sodom and all that's why those cities get wiped out. It's because of the inhospitality. Yeah. Or that they're destroyed, supposedly. Mm -hmm. But to be an unconditional move would have been to offer his own ass, right? <laughs> yeah, that would have been giving up yeah. his sovereignty. Um, that, yeah. That's why I was holding out there. That, right. that would have been giving up his <laughs> sovereignty. <laughs> but um, I mean, what's what's so wicked and scary here is that, of course, that's this is what we're talking about is not what you're supposed to be getting out of that story in its oh, yeah. biblical context. What are we supposed to be getting out of it there? In the biblical context, that he's made the ultimate sacrifice. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. There's lots of godly man. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's a godly man. For what? I'm sorry, you hear? It's got lots of godly man. Oh. So it makes you want to to be hospitable. Yeah. 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 Lots. So God gives his son. Yeah. 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 God gives up his son. Let's go to higher lives. Um, somehow it's different that he throws out his virgin daughters. Yeah. It's even, you know, it just doesn't. But surely we must read Kierkegaard's fear and trembling a little bit differently. If he gave us this episode instead, instead of Abraham, Abraham having his hands stayed. Right. Um so this is like I mean, you know, this is the set the penultimate story he gives us to close the book. So if anyone was hoping that this was a utopian effort at ethics, <coughs> the new ethics, then forget it, right? It's just like the rug just got pulled out yeah. from under you. But that's not the last story. He goes on, right? And now he's going to point us to the story of the, the pilgrim, right? Who knows that story? Um, okay. He's pointing us to the episode in Judges. On Mount Ephraim. Judges 23, 30. A man agrees to host and give shelter to a pilgrim, his concubine, and his entire entourage for a night. This is not an angel. Okay. Um, then when they get settled in, some wicked men in the city, that's a quote, show up, surround the house, pound the door, and shout to the, to the owner of the house, Quote, bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. Close quote. And then starts the unthinkable bargaining. All right. On behalf of the law. So here's the, this is New International Version, I think. Yeah. The owner of the house went outside and said to them, no, my friends, don't be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this disgraceful thing. Look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. I will bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish. But don't do this. But but to this man, don't do such a disgraceful thing. So the mob doesn't listen. The pilgrim take tosses out his concubine, and they rape and quote unquote abuse her all night, re releasing her at dawn. She crawls to the threshold of the master's house at dawn. And when the pilgrim finally wakes up, which is later and comes out, he says, get up, let's go. And there was no answer. Close quote. So he like hoists her lifeless body up onto his donkey, takes off, heads for home, and then this is the part where he cuts her up and sends the 12 parts out. Right. That is the closing story of the book. So once again, when the law is obeyed at the expense of the laws, we get the inverse of hospitality. It morphs into its opposite. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I was with him actually after that. This story, I, I, didn't, I wasn't really sure what biblical point I'm supposed to take, because it's the traveler, right? This was the Levite, mm -hmm. who takes his own concubine out. Right. So, mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, it's hard for me to read that as anything other than Basically, just saving his ass. I don't see where hospitality is even necessarily involved in the story, in the biblical story. The, um, well, wait, but the, the, the host comes out and offers up, even though it doesn't. That, yeah, the, oh, yeah, mom's okay. not interested, but he offers up his yeah, virgin okay. daughter yeah. and the concubine. <clears throat> Obviously, it's the women. Okay. Right. Right. But in the end, it was still the guest who had. It's the guest, yeah. who, had it's the guest who makes the toss. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and what are we supposed to. I, I actually have. I don't, I don't know. The, Story. What, are, what are we supposed to be getting out of the 
Has any man seen such, seen such a thing? I mean, what 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 is the Levite trying to communicate by sending out the chopped up pieces of his? Uh, I've never understood that either. The 12 tribes of Israel. You mean, we understand. Yeah, but why did they get, I mean, they they get why did they get, like why did they get, why did they get, I know, I, 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 I have memories. Yeah. What are we supposed to take from this story? I have oh, so many <laughs> problems with so many of the stories, especially the Old Testament, but but that one I've never known what to do with. Why, why? Why did you mean? Levites are weird? What's the point of that? Look at this, nobody's ever seen anybody do this. I just did it. And it's a it's such a horrible story. Yeah. It's so horrible. And is it true that, because I've heard this said, but I'm not a biblical scholar, and I, and I have tried to forget everything I've ever had to read it. Because I was forced to read it. I was, yeah. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, um, but uh, is it true that, that, there, that in any instance of rape in the Bible that the woman is never, like her, her testimony or testimony, She's never allowed to speak, or her voice is always silenced. There's never, um, a, she never says, like, she's killed immediately, or she's never, um, there's never a voice or anything. Like, there's never um, a, testify, a, te a testifying about it, or a wrong part. Anyone have an answer? I wonder about that. I wonder Victor, Victor would know yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not a good place to be a woman, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, right, yeah, I just think that's an interesting kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I think as far as, because this, I grew up in a pretty fucking fire and brimstone in the Baptist church. Um, and this story I actually remember hearing in a sermon, which is terrifying. Um, and I think the, the point of the story is really the, the wickedness that had come in um, to the nation that the Israelites had built. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, and throughout kind of this section of the Old Testament, there's a lot of these stories that are just like, It's punishment you know, for people, the people, the rape of the women are punishment for them. No, the sending of the, the, sending of the, the 12 day. pieces was this, um, this, this informant, I mean, what is, what is the, the, the quote saying? You know, has any man seen such a thing from the day the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt until this very day? Mm. So it's um, the corruption of the state. You know, so it's a national, mm -hmm. never has such a thing been done or seen since like the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt, you know, I mean, yeah, okay. Did not know that. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it makes a horrifying sense. So Derry Guy closes the book with this terrible story, these two terrible stories. Um, it, and I, I, would, I would think it would be strategic, right? I mean, obviously, this is, these are lectures, right? These are two lectures that pull together. Um, by Dufault Montel, um, but this this must be st a strategic way to close, right? Um, to make sure that the reader it doesn't. I mean, it didn't work for. A lot, I mean, I've, I've I've read a lot of people working out of this book who um, who believe that he's calling for um, a new ethics that An absolute hospitality. Yes, mm -hmm. absolute hospitality. Um, as if that were not the impossible, mm. right? Um, instead, what he would what he's suggesting here is that it is the impossible, and as the impossible, it's the condition of possibility for some kind of justice, mm. right? Something we could call justice. Um, Okay. Yeah. And, and on that note, that, that we end, so we end with the question: Are we the heirs to yeah. these stories, and where do we put the invariant? What's 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 the the unchanging? And then, but then this, they testify without end in our memory. I just think it's such a great way of occupying attention, since yeah. you've got testifying in the in the religious sense and testifying right. in the legal sense. Right. So that specifically, the testimony of these stories of hospitality is in the one sense. To some absolute law and, in a sense, yeah. to a juridical reality. Good. Uh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Right. That's good. So, to become what it is, the law needs the laws. And vice versa, as he said. 
Without that law of hospitality, the laws serve only the rights of the strongest. The, what he calls the demographico economic interests of the ones most capable of securing them, right? Without this, without the law. So justice, according to Derrida, requires that I keep both the law and the laws. And that means simultaneously that I break them both. Justice requires that I break the law and the laws in an effort to protect the laws. I'm sorry, in an effort to perfect the laws. To extend them and to keep them infinitely. This is an impossible aporia. Like, no way. No way. No way, no how. Right. And that's where justice is born, in the aporia, in the embrace of the aporia. What's not born there is a sort of um, couch potato political quietism, which is often what is uh, an accusation that is hurled at deconstruction and it dared up. Not fair. That's where um, a kind of just action can begin in the aporia. There's no excuse for non-action in Derrida. No excuse for it. He calls it urgent. Action is urgent, particularly in the face of an aporia, right? which means that some sort of decision becomes possible. So rather than a paralysis, this aporia is, sort of, is, is the opening of what we might call the public sphere. The space of a kind of genuine decision, genuine decision. D decision can only take place in the face of the undecidable, right? Where a kind of um, rhetorical reasoning is required that you think it through. Justice dis demands decisions, he tells us, right away, urgently, here and now, in the face of the undecidable. Any so-called decision that's not taken in the face of the undecidable is not a decision. It's pre-programmed. Justice dis demands decisions right away, here and now, in the face of the undecidable, in the, um, in the face and in response to this no passage sign. So, Derrida proposes, and this is on page 147, 149, that, quote, this distinction between the law and the laws requires us to determine what could be called, in Kantian language, but with um, a million kabats, intermediate schemas. <clears throat> and they would begin by asking, how can one give place to a situated ethics and politics dedicated to an infinite responsibility for hospitality that remains inaccessible for structural reasons. Structural reasons. How to intervene in the condition of hospitality in the name of the unconditional. He gives us one answer to this in, on cosmopolitanism, so we'll, we'll get there. Okay, so some specifics. Let's open the book. Start at the beginning, page three. The question of the foreigner. Before the foreigner is a question that we address ourselves to, a theme or a concept or a problem to contemplate. He says, it's a question we address to the foreigner. Who are you? What's your name? Why are you here? Where do you come from? Therefore, the foreigner is both the one to whom you address the first question and the one who puts the first question to you. 
You ask the question because you are in the presence of one you don't know and don't identify with, a foreigner. The foreigner, he says, is being in question. Hyphens, being in question. One big fat question mark. Which puts me and what I know into question. And that's why I pose the question, who are you? I need to know. So the, he ends, but also the, the foreigner is the, also the one who, putting the first question, puts me in question. And, and by putting me in question, he's in danger. <laughs> right. That's, that's where the danger starts. Um, so he then, he makes a reference to Levinas. At the bottom of that page says, um, one's, one thinks of Levinas, no, one thinks of the situation of the third person and of justice, which Levinas analyzes, as the birth of the question. Somebody said they, they, they read, was it you read Levinas? Um, does anyone want to talk about this, the, the third person, the third party in Levinas? Okay. Um, See if I can do this quickly. So, in in Levinas, um, and this entire meditation on hospitality is um, inspired by Levinas's work. So he's never far from this this text. Derrida is not Levinas. They're, they're not doing the same thing. They are not conflatable. But, but Derrida is in, incredibly inspired by what Levinas is doing, and they agree on many, many points. Um, what he's alluding to here, the idea of the third party being the birth of the question, is this. In Levinas, um, it, the other capital O, is the one to whom I owe everything. Infinite responsibility. The other, the first one on the scene, etc. I owe infinitely everything. Infinite hospitality. Infinite responsibility. in such a pre-originary way that that, um, that offering up of everything, that infinite responsibility is not a choice. It's not conscious. Um, and there's no question. It happens without question. There's no one around to question. But, because in the interhuman condition there's more than one other, you're always presented with more than one other. The third party shows up, and now I'm in trouble because I can't give my everything to more than one other birth of the question. And that and the question is justice in Levinas. This is the birth of the question of justice. It's also the birth of consciousness, etc. Because now I have to figure it out. Who do I owe more? What are these two to each other? Um, etc. Right. So now there's a question. There's a question of um, not only in infinite ethics, but um, of politics, right? Um, it's a political question that gets born here, and the possibility of a legislated ethics. And I'm born, 
and there's a recognition that I'm now the other of another. So, you know, enter finally some concern for myself. Um, so he's, that's what he's alluding to here. The idea of the third party is the birth of the question of justice. Okay. Um, let's skip to page seven. Well, I guess let's talk about this for just one second. Plato's um, dialogues, he, he goes, he turns to those a lot. Um, and he says, and he's going to look first at the sophist. Have you all read the sophist? A few of you there. Yeah. Um, okay, so Plato carries and puts this question of the foreigner um, in several of his works. They're, we're going to look at the sophist first, he says. And it is the foreigner who, by putting forward the unbearable question, the parasite question, contests the thesis of Parmenides. Hold on, pack that in a second. Puts in question the logos of our father, Parmenides. Uh, per, Parmenides. Um, what happens in the sophist is that the sophist, um, who's a foreigner, says, I want to say something. I want to say something that even, it's so obvious even a blind person could see it. But in doing so, I'm going to have to challenge the paternal figure, Parmenides, um, the, the, the treaties that, um, the treaties on being. And I'm going to challenge that. And so I'm asking you, first of all, to not see me as a parasite. I'm going to challenge the father, but please don't see me as that. So one of the things that Derrida is doing here, it's very interesting, why, he's asking, why would a foreigner, how could we even conceive of a foreigner as a parasite? How is that even possible? That would have to be, as he says, the, the foreigner would have to be a son, not a foreigner. It would be a parasite. So why, for in the fir that's the first question, why would the foreigner even ask such a thing? Because the foreigner is already in, in the city, under the father, right? just as the guest and the parasite. So from the inside, the foreigner is an internal alterity. This is where a treatise on non-being comes in, right? Um, and that's the challenge of the, the traditional standard logos of the father par Parmenides on being. It's going to be challenged here by the foreigner. Um, and the foreigner feels it necessary in the very beginning to say, please don't consider me a parasite. And, and then continues and says, you know, this is difficult because... You know, all you have to do, since I'm challenging the accepted law or the accepted logos, the logos of the Father, um, all you really are going to have to do is go, Pfft, you're, you're loco, you're mad, right? This isn't, these are the words of a madman. And then I can be dismissed, right? Or killed or whatever. Um, thank you. Um, and so what, what Derrida's pointing to here is the idea that, um, first of all, that the foreigner is already in the family, so to speak, on the inside, right, in some sense. And second of all, that the foreigner, even before he begins to speak, understands he's threatened. He's threatened because he's seen as a threat. This foreign son. 
So on page 11, the foreigner carries and puts the fearful question. He sees or foresees himself. He knows he is already put into question by the paternal and reasonable authority of the Logos. The paternal authority of the Logos gets ready to disarm him, to treat him as mad. And this at the very moment when his question, the question of the foreigner, only seems to contest in order to remind people of what ought to be obvious even to a blind person. There's the situation of the foreigner. He moves then into the statesman, um, and later he'll track Oedipus. Uh, but the idea is that um, if the foreigner has to put the fearful question, the question that puts into question paternal logic, in other words, it's because he sees himself as already put into question by paternal authority of the Logos. If he's afraid, it's because the paternal Logos can already disarm him because he's going to go against the grain. He's a foreigner on the inside. Let's look at page 15. This is in the Apology. Um, you've read the Apology of Socrates, right? What's going on there? What's that about? He's on trial, yes. but he's basically apologizing. And apologizing. If he, well, if he was his attorney, please. Oh, he just he was put on trial. Um, and he is um, basically saying that he's willing to die for his ideas as opposed to the, like, because that is the right thing to do. Okay. Because if he were to challenge and go into exile, he would be violating his own ideas. Good. Good. So. Yeah, so his apology is no apology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His apology is I'm not apologizing, damn it. That's what my wife always says. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't try to These things really still resonate. Yeah, got so it. It's a citation. <laughs> Everything's a citation. <laughs> Were you going to say something different? Oh, no. no. Okay. Yeah, that, that generally sums it up. So that's the situation here. Now, page 15 sort of sets a nice scene, so um, if you have the patience, I'd really like for someone to just read the entire page. <laughs> Can someone do that? Page 15. Socrates, at the very beginning of his defense, Socrates addresses his fellow citizens and Athenian judges. He defends himself against the accusation of being a kind of sophist or skillful speaker. He announces that he is going to say what is right and true, certainly, against the liars who are accusing him, but without rhetorical elegance, without flower, flowery use of language. He declares that he is foreign to the language of the courts, to the tribune of the tribunals, he doesn't know how to speak this courtroom language, this legal rhetoric of accusation, defense, and pleading. He doesn't have the skill. He is like a foreigner. Among the serious problems we are dealing with here is that of the foreigner who, in speaking the language, always risks being without defense before the law of the country that welcomes or expels him, the foreigner is first of all to the legal language the foreigner is first of all foreign to the legal language in which the duty of hospitality is formulated, the right to asylum, its limits, norms, policing, etc. He has to ask for hospitality in a language which by definition is not his own, the one imposed on him by the master of the house, the host, the king, the lord, the authorities, the nation, the state, the father, etc. This personage imposes on him translation, 
into their own language, and that's the first act of violence. That is where the question of hospitality begins. Must we ask the foreigner to understand us, to speak our language in all the senses of this term, in all its possible extensions, before being able, and so as to be able, to welcome him into our country? If he is already speaking our language, with all that it, it implies, if we already shared everything that is shared with the language, would the foreigner still be a foreigner? And could we speak of asylum or hospitality in regard to him? This is the paradox that we are going to see become clearer. Thank you. Okay. First act of violence. What is it? First act of violence. Language. Not just language. Requiring but foreigners to speak our language. Yeah. Yes. Our What's the problem there? What's the paradox? Well, you're not a foreigner for speaking language. You're already in. Like you were saying about Parmenides. If you can already, and not just speak the language, but everything that goes along with that. I mean, you share a culture, right? It's a forced assimilation. I'm sorry? A forced assimilation. Well, but it, you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't possess the language needed to defend you are the very you being. You, you don't even you don't even have the terms to define your stasis. You can't even take advantage of the rights that are already accorded to you. Well, but I mean, the paradox is <coughs> more paradoxical than that, though, right? I mean, like the foreigner can't even state his foreignness without <laughs> being able to enter into a dialogue mm -hmm. in this language that is not his own, which. Is necessary for him to be a foreigner. Right? The foreigner wouldn't be a foreigner if he could already speak the language and already understood everything that came with that. The foreigner wouldn't be a foreigner. In which case, could we even speak of asylum or hospitality? Right? That's the character. Um, so Socrates basically is asking the courts to treat him like a foreigner. So he can have the rights of a foreigner, which tells us that the foreigner had some rights in Athens. The foreigner had some rights, as he points out on, on page 19. The foreigner had some rights. There were rights to hospitality. But the first, first thing that's asked of them is to speak the language. So, so Socrates asked to be treat, treated like a foreigner and then asked for special treatment. Because right. I don't speak the language. Okay, so um, f uh, flip over to 21. And, and just yeah. just Go in ahead. general, we see that in a really concrete way all the time and that people who are most in need of, I mean, this is just way more particular, but the people who are most in need of various social services are often least adept in using the language required to Absolutely. access the services. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's right. Well, this is, yeah, you can see this played out very concretely all the time, and, but it's one of the problems of the rights and duties of hospitality. I mean, what else would you do? I mean, don't you have to know? Don't they have to speak your language, right? Um, in order for hospitality in the classical sense to operate. Don't you have to pick and choose who comes in, who doesn't? Don't you have to have standards, etc.? That's the paradox. That reinvigorates yeah. this horrible story of Locke at the end, who does, after all, go out and find the angels, you know, the fish and trappers, before everybody <coughs> else, all these other robbers in the city. Good. Uh, and, you know, which is what makes the situation so is that he is not like he's just a jerk off. I mean, right. He is actually involved in a law of hospitality that would be responsive to exactly this problem. Exactly. Like, That's right. That's right. Once again, the paradox. Right. Okay, so on page 21, um, we'll get the discussion of, um, of these rights and duties of hospitality as a pact. They're described as a pact. Um, so the foreigner, or Xenos, 
has some rights and is not the absolute other, as Derrida puts it. Who's the absolute other? The barbarian. This is, we're going to come back, very interesting, we'll come back to this. The barbarian, the savage, the absolutely excluded. The foreigner is something else. The foreigner has some rights. Relations with the foreigner are governed by a pact. A xenia. The pact offers hospitality but also comes with some obligations. And those obligations and rights are extended to descendants, right? <coughs> Which means that you have to have a name and a family name. First, you have to be identified, anticipated, identified, tracked, right? Tracked and trackable. Um, 23. Oh, let me note, let me, let me point this up too, at the bottom of 21, top of 23. <clears throat> um, it's not only a question of the citizenship offered to someone who had none previously, but of the right to, of the right granted to the foreigner as such, to the foreigner remaining a foreigner, that's important, and to his or her relatives, to the family, to the descendants. So you don't have to be assimilated. You can remain a foreigner and still have some rights in Athens. But then the question is, how foreign can you be? And how foreign can you be to get those rights? You can't be a barbarian. You can't be a savage. You have to have a name, right, and a family name. To be trackable, you have to be able to assume some obligations because this is a reciprocal pact. Okay, so we understand that the contract, page 23, involves reciprocity. <clears throat> Rights granted to the foreigner who remains a foreigner, no naturalization required, to his or her family, household, and descendants. Right or contract presupposes social and familial status of, of the contracting parties. You have to be able to call them by name, he says. Well, can I ask a question? Yeah. And I, don't really, I really don't mean to complicate it, but this, you, this is Athens, correct? And they had slaves. Yeah. So, I mean, Not where, a slave. A foreigner yeah. can't be a slave. A foreigner yeah. can't be a slave, but wh wh where are the slaves from? Aren't they from like, just like another city <coughs> on near in the kind of Greek Isles that they had conquered 100 years ago? Yeah. Why? Well, my question is, is the differentiation between the slave and the foreigner, and oh, yeah. who's like, where are the, the status? I'm not trying to like pull out some justice for the slaves. I'm just trying to understand no, this is the hierarchy. What, this is what Derrida is trying to point out. The foreigner isn't just anyone who's other. The foreigner has to be someone with a name, a family name, right? Not a barbarian, not a slave, not a savage. Someone, in other words, from another society, much mm -hmm. like ours. But isn't that turned upside down by the fact that Socrates is from Athens, and he's only foreign to the language, and he's refusing exile, he's refusing to become a foreigner. How is that turned upside down? What, so, so, um, talk some more. Because, because of the name of being recognized as a person, I mean, he would be recognized as an Athenian. Right, so, I'm not making a connection. So being recognized by that, by the name, by his identity, he would not be foreign. Oh no, he's asking, absolutely, well, he's, he's not a foreigner. foreign. He's only foreign to the language. He's, he's not a foreigner, he's asking to be treated as a foreigner with those same rights. Right? He's asking to be treated as a foreigner with those same rights and um, with some sort of um, mercy for the fact that he doesn't know how to speak this language, right? this legal language. But the foreigner, he's not asking to be treated as a slave or a savage or a barbarian. He's asking to be treated as a foreigner who has some rights. So there's not, in other words, here's the condition. A foreigner is a very specific thing. And, on, and the foreigner with a, with a family name can enter into a pact, a reciprocal pact for the rights 
and duties of hospitality. Right? That di this is in no way, shape, or form unlimited or unconditional. Yeah, and I know this is another tradition. This is even coming out of Latin. This is in no way in my mind. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's not connected to pro se or any sort of like, you know, like defending oneself. Like a pro se, um, you, know, you know, a person who defends themselves in court is sort of like a foreigner in a court because they're not speaking the language of the court. And they can totally throw proceedings off and a lot of times win because it will be a complete travesty to convict someone who is completely throwing... Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Like it, sometimes it can actually be a very, it can be a winning strategy because you can you can be completely ignorant. You're talking about Socrates' strategy here. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying it's almost like a pro se strategy. I'm thinking. Sure. I know that's not. And you don't have to put the same rules as a lawyer would. So right, right. Well, you could break rules, and, yeah. and sort of they have to sort of. Because you're not speaking the you're not expected to speak the lawyer's language. You can break these rules. Well, you could be sympathetic in a way. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the judge doesn't necessarily have to admit it all. No. Yeah. <clears throat> Exactly. Well, in the case of Socrates, you can argue that the reason he has to be killed is that he can articulate his foreignness so successfully in the language of the Athenians. Yeah. So that if you showed up as the person defending yourself and you presented from at the beginning, before removing yourself from the language of the courts, you present at the beginning as a fluent lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, then then you're stuck afterwards. You he can't be granted the right of foreignness because he's so adeptly presented right. his need for the right of foreignness. And it's really okay. I, this is kind of a catch twenty two. It's all very this is all very interesting stuff that he's pointing to in terms by reading the, these texts across the idea of hospitality and the foreigner. It's very interesting what's going on in these texts. It, 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 you really should reread them from this angle. Um, but yeah, absolutely. That's the strategy, and um, and that was a that was a nice nice uh, a, a, um, addition as well. But yes, thank you for saying slaves. Um, I shouldn't have left that out. But. And so so Athens removes any connection to the family name that they recognize, but of course that doesn't go away, right? Say, say well, I mean, you know, you're a slave. You start a family. Oh, oh, you yeah. know your family, your family name. You're from this conquered city a right. hundred right. miles he away. Has no status. That's but right. it's like it's, no it's removed and disappeared and out somewhere outside of that frame that is right. now according to the foreigner That's in the right. city next door right. to that. You have, a slave has no status yeah. except right. property, <clears throat> and so and so that's not the same. Yeah. Right. Within the like the bounds of the yeah. like I mean, the slaves have their own community in some ways. Do they have their own sense of hospitality? No, they have what? Is it microcosm? I don't know. I don't know what this what slave life was like. Life life was like. Well, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how we would know, right? I don't know about this slave hospitality, but I know that in the illegal, in the illegal immigrant community in upstate New York, there's an enormous amount of hospitality for um, people who are coming, yeah. and it it goes. Um, Pretty much, if you're from Central or South America, you have a blanket entree into homes, foods, jobs, and you have to then work in a way that is not. I don't mean work. I mean, is it reciprocal? Yeah, you can't fuck it up. You can't right. <laughs> get drunk and break the window at the bar. And but it's like a waitress. Like I mean, I have, I have a apparently I have a squatter in the basement. I have. I, I noticed a pair of shoes and a. Fam a book of family photographs. In your basement? I, not in my basement, where I live, like a rental property. And I noticed the door was open, and there was a chair set up, and a pair of shoes that were apparently drying, and then a, a full book of family photographs sitting there and on the chair. So I, I put them on the shoes and kind of moved it around on the side, and I locked the door. But he must have known how to get in because there was the key hanging and he had unlocked it. And so I put the word out within this, my friends in the community, who could this be? It's okay, I just don't want, I just want to know the terms for safety reasons. Yeah. But it's, um, right. you know, they have a lot of need, but then you have to kind of. Like, you have to protect your home. It's, it's, it's a life. Like how, I mean, how open can the door be? Who knows? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Harry, I, I, I like, what you bring up in the sense of 
how it constrains, um, I mean, how it becomes really, really constrained on what this idea of, of a name is, right? Of, of, of identi being identifiable um, within, the, within the polls, within the city, you know? But it's like, yes, the slaves absolutely have their own social system entirely. Um, and there are probably other cities that have social systems that aren't going to be recognized as foreign. constraint of definition and of translatability um, kind of plays in this in a big way. Absolutely. And it demonstrates once again what Derrida calls the power of hospitality. Right? Who gets to decide what a family name is? The host. Right? Yes, there, there may be a system of family names, but it's not recognized. Yeah. Right? This, that's not recognized. As a family name, there's no line of descent that is recognized by the authority granting the hospitality. Right, so there's the power of hospitality and um, the violence of it as well. Right, the violence of hospitality. It's a wild thought, but that's what he's trying to show us: the violence inherent. The, the hospitality, right, of, in, in the classical sense. We have like two minutes, so I hesitate to go into the next um, piece. Um, I tell you what, you know, we're working through of hospitality. We're going to take our time. We'll do. We'll do. Um, we'll just take it as it comes. If we move this through this very quickly, we'll move on to on cosmopolitanism. Um, if we don't, we won't. We'll stick with this as long as we want to, and we'll move on um, according to our own temporality, okay? Um, unless anyone feels the need to rush ahead, in which case you can... Well, can we start bringing okay. things in from, I mean, because there's such a, so nice... There's, kind of by, by design, these are, there's a lot of overlap. Right. So, yes, sure, feel free. Has everyone read all the texts, or do you need us to wait a little? Um, it's not like we're going to ruin the ending or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay.